Mm. Hello, guys. Uh, it's Linda here. Hi, Linda. Oh, hi, Rosan. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, if I can share my screen after the intro, right? The thing is, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do it. Uh, I'm going to start off the webinar. I'm going to um, introduce the company first with a few slides. Uh, I'm going uh -huh. to explain about the course and then and what we do. And then I'm going to I'm going to be sharing my screen for the beginning for the first few slides. And then I'll give the screen to you, and you'll be doing your presentation. Awesome. And then we, when you finish your presentation, we'll do the question and answer session. And then at the end, I'll take the stream back to myself to finish off and wrap up the presentation with a few slides, okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me well, yeah? Yeah, yeah, sure, I can hear you. Okay. And where are you calling in from today? I'm calling in from India, Bangalore. Mm -hmm. I'm located in Latvia, which is the northern Europe. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Hot nice. sunny day today as well. Oh. So you have summer there now? Yeah, yeah, we have, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, for us, it's hot. It's 30 degrees. <laughs> oh, okay. Northern hemisphere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start very soon now. Yeah, it's 5 p.m. here, and you are two and a half hours later or more? Yeah, two and a half yeah. hours, 7.30. Okay. An interesting topic you're doing today. Oh, yeah, so I've had these challenges, so I thought uh, it's a good topic to share with the people. Mm -hmm. So usually PMs are very delivery focused, you know, you know, release this feature, do this, fix this and whatnot. And there's a softer aspect that we miss out from the problem piece. So I thought uh, it's a good idea to share this piece. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is something different. Yeah, different perspective. <laughs> Actually came across Product Star on LinkedIn. That's how I connected with uh, Julia. Ah, okay, LinkedIn, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I see that it's a big community. Where is Product Star actually based out of? The current headquarters are in Moscow, yeah. But now we're going global, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of experience in Russia. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Mm -hmm. uh, can you confirm that you see my presentation? You see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, everyone who is joining us today. Uh, I'm Linda. I'm from Product Star. And please welcome to our today's webinar. We have a very interesting um, theme today. Uh, and it's called uh, Problem Framing How to Love the Problem First So That You Can Love the Solution Later with Prasant Tavalam, who is a product leader at Dell Technologies. So, this is going to be a very interesting one. So guys, uh, I would like to ask you just to, you know, be active in the, uh, in the chat section today, please. Tell us who you are, where you're from, which country, which city, which company you work for. And please share with us, you know, are you just starting out in product management or are you already experienced? And, you know, what is your experience in product management? So, yeah, send your questions and comments as well. Um, yeah, this is your opportunity to, you know, we have the live session here, so you can ask your questions directly to our speaker. So please do use this opportunity. The full recording of the webinar and the presentation will be available on our Telegram channel tomorrow on June 21st. And of course, it's gonna be also available on our YouTube channel. So for those of you who are late or didn't make it, please come back to our channel and watch it. Uh, the best question at the end will receive a present at this, you know, at the end of the session. So, guys, please, you're really welcome, you know, to be active with your questions. And the best question will get a present from us, from our company, Global Star. Um, so, a little bit to introduce ourselves, you know, our company. Uh, so, we we are doing a product management online course, which is a six-month online course. 
and it consists of 60 lectures and 60 practical exercises from verified industry professionals. Our online platform allows you to complete the course at your own pace, so it's very convenient. You can go as fast or as slow as you wish. At the end of the course, we'll help you find an employer and prepare for job interviews. And we also provide you with great networking opportunity. You can communicate with your peers within the course group and receive mentor support. So who this course is perfect for? So first of all, marketers, yeah? Uh, marketers who want to get into product management and build a career in product marketing. It's also good for top managers. You know, you can structure your work and systematically develop digital products. This course, of course, is suitable for project, project managers. Um, you can learn the methodologies for making product decisions, master frameworks. And of course, it's very great for product managers. You can fill in the gaps in your knowledge. You can level up your skills and discover new ideas. So what will be in the course? Uh, if, if we talk about it in gist, yeah? um, so it's a six months of training. You know, we are doing the theoretical part and what is great about our course is that we're also doing the, you know, the training and the practical part. So you get the best industry sub specialist, 60 lectures and also followed by 60 workshops. There'll be webinars and workshops, of course. So we have live question and answer sessions, group chats with participants, which allows you, you know, for the free flow exchange of experiences and knowledge sharing. Then you'll be given homeworks. After going through each lesson, you'll be provided with video recordings of the lectures, chat log materials, and a homework assignment as well. And as I said, there's gonna be a flexible study schedule. You can study at the time convenient for you and recordings will be available to you. And then at, uh, at the end, there's the graduation project. You know, there's full development of your work project or pet project, uh, which will solidify the knowledge that you gain throughout the course. And of course, we also provide you with employment assistance. There are pre-interview training sessions and recommendations from course creators and guests. So lots of useful things. And guys, you can find out more details about the course by following at the links, you know, below, just below this video picture, you know, productstar.org-productlive. You can fill in the, the information, you know, you can leave us your name, your, you know, your country, your phone number, your email. And if you do that, you know, you'll be join, joining our WhatsApp group and you'll never miss our latest news, our latest webinars and information. So please do leave your details and we'll be in touch with you guys through WhatsApp, through email. We're also calling out guys, uh, you guys, so we can find out more information, you know, about you, uh, what do you expect to gain from these webinars? How do you like them? Do you find them useful and so on? So, you know, we can just get uh, most out of these things together. Um, now I'm going to give the word to the speaker, yeah, and then, you know, he's going to do the presentation and we're going to do the question and answer session, guys, so, okay, welcome, Prasant, I'm going to switch Thank off you. my screen so you can switch on your screen, your screen. Sure. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hello, folks. Uh, if you're sharing my deck. Mm -hmm. I can see it, yeah. Today's, uh, yeah, so today's topic, so you're able to see the screen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Today's topic is uh, problem framing. Uh, so most of the product managers, so this topic is relevant to uh, everybody who is a problem solver, right? So it doesn't have to be necessarily product management. It could be project management or it could be consulting. So anybody who works uh, in the area of problem solving uh, can derive benefit out of this. So topic is how to love the problem first so that you love the solution later. Uh, I'm going to share very simple techniques in this in terms of softer aspects of the problems which uh, usually we tend to ignore, right? Let me give a quick introduction about myself. So my name is Prashant Tavalam. I'm a senior product manager at Dell Technologies. I'm a trainer. I'm a problem solver because I do a lot of uh, coaching for the teams. I'm creative by nature, so I keep doing a lot of public workshops, especially on the creative space. And I love traveling. And yeah, you can connect on LinkedIn, uh, Prashant Tavalam, right? So with this, let me uh, tell you what are the key takeaways uh, from the problem framing uh, webinar today. So I'm gonna share with you five-step problem framing process. This is coming from Design Sprint Academy. This is what the Googles of the world practice. Uh, which I think uh, will be relevant for you folks. 
also share re with relevant examples. So I'm going to share uh, with you and with an example. So it, it's a lot more clearer what uh, how you can approach the problem framing uh, process. Then I also at the end of uh, the session, we will also give you uh, some reference information or tips which you can take back. So that's the agenda for the webinar. So let me start with the statement which says a problem clearly stated is a problem half solved. So this was stated by a famous American writer. Uh, so it's very true that if you don't understand the problem enough, uh, then you're not actually solving the right problem. So in fact, when I was trying to explore the problem framing process, it, we, the exercise itself takes about two and a half, three days to almost a week where you spend extensive time with the problem, not the solution. Uh, so you spend extensive time with the problem, only then you appreciate what the problem is all about. There is so much to uncover within the problem, which we actually miss out that I'm going to share today. So this statement is beautifully reflecting that understanding the problem actually takes a lot of time. That's what this actually, this statement actually means. Once you understand the problem completely, 360 degrees, then it's a lot more easier to go and uh, come up with solutions. With my hundreds of interaction with a lot of product management professionals, what I figured, what majority of them are so solution oriented that they have a solution in mind and then they try to retrofit the problem to suit the solution. For example, somebody would already know that if I automate a certain process, I'm go I can fix this problem, right? So they're already coming with a solution-oriented mindset, missing out a lot in terms of understanding the problem, missing the empathy piece. There are a lot of people who also come back and say, hey, I know that we need to create this kind of reporting or a dashboard, hence we will solve these problems. So there's a lot that we will discuss today in terms of uh, aspects that we miss out, right? So why you need to do problem framing? Why is problem framing important at all? One is it helps you define the purpose why you're solving the problem. Also the scope of a decision, right? So you, once you frame the problem, you know exactly what is the scope. There is no scope creep that is happening, right? And hence, once you understand the problems, come up with a solution, once the problem uh, is framed very well, the solutions are also concrete and con concise, right? And hence, when you start writing your user stories, it reflects clarity in terms of what is the specific scope. Else there's a lot of scope creep and ultimately you end up missing your deadlines, right? So then the second point why you need to do problem framing or why you need to understand problem framing is to prioritize what success actually means, right? Also, I'm going to talk to you in terms of biases, which is the core of the issue with the problems, because we tend to make a lot of assumptions uh, because of the kind of experiences we've had in the past. As a result, we miss out so much uh, in between. So this is, this is a very simple five-step problem framing process, uh, which is the core slide of the webinar today. So let me uh, start by explaining how to, how to start with the problem statement. So before you finalize a problem, you need to get into a team, right? You form a team of uh, whatever kind of stakeholders you want to involve. You want to include people from different departments who are really influenced. You include, so basically this calls for uh, stakeholder recruitment. So you recruit stakeholders who should be part of this facilitation workshop. Right? So when you when you're actually approaching a bigger problem, you bring in all relevant stakeholders who directly or indirectly impact uh, the solution or have a problem uh, in place. Right? So what happens is when you bring that, you prioritize in terms of uh, what kind of problem you want to solve. So once the problem is prioritized and everybody has agreed that they want to pick one problem to solve, right? At this point, you are not even sure if that problem is the right problem to solve, right? So based on voting, you pick a problem, right, to solve. It doesn't mean that this is the best problem to solve or we have understood the problem completely. At this point, there's a lot of abstraction that exists, right? You still go ahead based on voting system to pick a problem. 
then you describe so the i'm talk uh, now i'll talk to you about the contextualizing the problem phase here is where you spend a lot of time in terms of removing the bias uh, i'll explain this so what i'll explain this with an example we did a small exercise okay, as part of a consulting project where the problem was there's no clear view of order to fulfillment journey and in life cycle management for b2b customers this was for a telecom client where let's say uh, i'm part of a corporate company and i want to place uh, order for sim cards or i want to uh, place order for some products uh, as a customer i don't have complete visibility until and unless the final delivery happens so no visibility to the whole flow so i don't know where my order is stuck what are the kind of issues that exist and this whole process is uh, uh, you know called as the order and fulfillment journey and the in life cycle management is the phase where let's say as a corporate customer i want to change the number of uh, parts that i ordered i want to increase the number of sim cards from 5 to 10 or change some other uh, things i want to change the ship shipping address etc that kind of visibility into the orders was not existing and then this was the kind of problem we wanted to solve and this came out of the voting system at this point there's still lot of abstraction that exists which is okay a problem when you start off will have lot of abstraction which is okay so when you pick a problem based on voting system we proceeded further to do what is called as contextualizing the problem this is the first step of getting into the actual problem framing you have a problem which is agreed by all the stakeholders then what happens is you ask a question what is the problem you are solving get into a very descriptive way of explaining what the problem is all about in my previous slide i explained what the problem is all about you can also detail out a lot more in terms of what according to you is the problem right once you have done that the next step is you need to ask what have you tried in the past so you will see in this particular image there was a lot of effort put into understanding what are the different departments or who are the different stakeholders involved and what have they done what have they tried so far in order to fix that particular problem right so they tried to create a self service portal they had their account manager assigned uh, to a corporate partner there was a services team which tried to fix any sort of challenges that they had they had a dedicated team assigned they were also trying to test out new portals so these are some of the things as an organization or as a team they would have tried out in the past and still they could not fix the problem right then the next topic is what are some of the barriers because of which the problem could not be solved so this again helps the stakeholders to call out all the possible challenges that they faced in order to solve the problem right for example it could be people problems where they were not friendly or the portal was not responsive or it was very cumbersome to use uh, having a service manager was very difficult because there's a lot of uh, back and forth that was happening there's abstraction in the navigation uh, so there is less involvement by the end users so there are all the challenges that comes out at this point what happens is you are actually helping the stakeholders clear out their thoughts or bring out all their thoughts and put it on a piece of paper and you do a brainstorming exercise like this you understood hey these are all the things that we have done in the past and these are the kind of challenges we have had while trying to fix the problem right the the third one or the fourth point here which says uh, is the most interesting aspect uh, that i also came across which is what does critical success factor look like or what does success look like for you if i said my current portal is sluggish then what according to you is success what is an awesome or the most perfect uh, portal that you have come across i would then say hey i have come across this uh, amazon site amazon.com which had uh, this wonderful navigation i think it was so smooth it was so easy to navigate through 
So then what happens is, you know, you, there's a source of inspiration. So you put down all the sources of inspiration. We'll see in the image that we figured out that we liked some part of Amazon ordering portal. We looked at how uh, Uber uh, app works, the way we order for cabs. So we, we wanted to get inspiration from there. There were some stakeholders who said, I really like the way Netflix works in terms of a certain flow, right? Why can't we look at Netflix? Then somebody also said, in terms of collaboration, why can't we look at Paytm, right? Or if somebody said, hey, Airbnb has an awesome navigation in terms of it's highly visual, it's a lot more interactive, so it's easy to navigate and has fewer steps. So this way, you give the stakeholders an opportunity to uh, explain or demonstrate in terms of what is their perfect world look like, what is their perfect portal look like, or a perfect problem looks like. So what happens in return is you're trying to capture all the possible best practices that exist in the outer world, right? So we as expert panel who comes in, come in as stakeholders, try to discuss out to say, what have we tried in the past? What didn't work because of some of the barriers? And what kind of examples can we pick? What kind of uh, features and uh, products or examples can we look at to emulate, right? So this kind of opens up our mind in terms of, hey, I know we have done so many things in the past. We've had some barriers, but why don't we try this, right? So there are, there are, it opens up ideas in terms of what kind of lean experiments you can try. So trust me, if you actually follow this methodology, there's a lot of insight you'll get in terms of what are the barriers and what does success actually look like. Even if you leave out what you have tried in the past, the barriers and success gives you a lot of insight, right? And also your problems can have a lot of abstractness, also some amount of specificity in it. So it takes a lot of detailing. It could also go through churns in terms of trying to perfect uh, the answers that you put into this. You could also do a couple of rounds. But once you do this, there's a lot more clarity that sinks in in terms of where are we currently? You understand the as is. So understanding the as is also takes a lot of effort. This particular exercise could take almost one or two days to complete. And then finally, the entire team agrees on uh, the final contextualization of the problem. So this simple exercise can be very, uh, you know, brain teasing. It could be it could tease your brain. It could. It is a good mental workout in terms of uh, finally arriving at this picture. Once you arrive at this picture you know where you are at this point in terms of as is. Now, what's interesting is this is called as uh, cognitive biases, right? As humans, uh, like I told you earlier, we have certain experiences that uh, we have acquired as we have uh, in our professional lives, right? Because of our experiences, a lot of the decisions we make, a lot of the thought process are influenced by uh, the experiences we've had. And these questions, which we discussed uh, in the previous slide, which was what have we tried in the past has to do with outcome bias, wherein humans can base the decisions based on only outcomes and ignore the context. By you know asking the questions, by trying to put out all our thoughts in terms of what have we done in the past, kind of puts on hold or brings out all the outcome biases onto the paper. The next question is, what were some of the barriers and constraints you had? So sometimes we ignore the negative information uh, for lack of time or lack of clarity because we are running on deadlines. You would have missed the point of understanding the negative information which you should have put out, right? So this is a good exercise. And even in fact, a good question to ask, what were some of the barriers or constraints that exist? Right? That way you're also capturing all the negative information that exists. Right? The stakeholders are able to think hard and pull out all examples and put it on the board. The third one is what were some of the success factors and what does that look like? So this is called as confirmation bias. You liked something on amazon.com or you liked something on Airbnb or some particular product that you tried out and you felt that was really awesome. And that, that actually meant 
uh, seamless or success to you, right? So you want to bring that onto the floor and discuss this out and see if you can get consensus and then you put it on the paper. So this way, what happens is you are able to address outcome, outcome bias. You're also able to address confirmation bias. And then you're able to address uh, ostrich bias, which is you know ignoring the negative information. So this kind of now sets you on a path of, hey, this is where we exist. And these are certain things that we want to actually try out. There's another step uh, in the whole process, right? The next step is the clar clarify business need. So the, the webinar is going to talk mostly about contextualizing the problem and clarifying the business need because out in the market, out in the product management world, we already do user research empathy map user journey, which has already tools and techniques, which most of us are aware of. What we miss is the juice and the fun in working and understanding the problem. So far, we looked at how to contextualize a problem in terms of negating all the biases that we stakeholders can have while solving the problem. We did that with contextualizing the problem. Now we'll look at how to clarify business need. In, and when you try to clarify the business need, you know, you have questions like, what do you want to actually achieve, right? So now that you understand what is the as is, it becomes so much easy. So what we did was, what we were trying to achieve was a simple, quick, transparent, efficient way to procure products. So you see the problem which we started off was how do we create a portal to how do we create a quick, transparent and efficient way to procure a product. Now we are bringing in a lot of user context. We are trying to actually move away from solution orientation to understanding from what the customer actually wants. What they really need is a simple, quick and transparent way and efficient way to procure products. And this simple you know, statement actually opens up a lot more doors in terms of solutioning. And what does measure of success look like? So these are nothing but how do you have critical success factors defined? I want to see increase in adoption by the users. I want to see retention of customers. I think this is a standard product management practice where you define critical success factors. So you're getting a lot more specific now moving away from abstract, right? And then what are the steps to achieve the goals, right? You identify users' pain areas, you do user research, you do prototyping, blah, blah, blah. So these are some of the specific activities that any product management team can do, right? So it gets very specific. Then comes the interesting part. This is the most interesting part I want to cover. We miss out this all the time. If nothing changes, how will the future look like? How will the existing solution look like? Suppose things did not change. There was no solution in place. The problem still continued to exist. How would the future look like for the team or for the company? This is a very bold question. It's a very, very strong question to ask. Uh, it may seem very simple, but when you actually get into discussing what exactly can happen in the future, it could also result in shutting down of the company. There are a lot of such companies. For example, Kodak, it could be Sony's Walkman. Uh, these are some of the products which did not do well after some time because they didn't look into the future and actually solve for the right problems. So at this point, you need to ask if nothing changes, if status quo exists, how, how does the future look like in five years from now? It could look to lower satisfaction, lower adoption rate, lower cost loss of customers, revenues, et cetera, et cetera. So once this idea actually hits you, then you know what are the worst case scenarios that are possible, right? You also need to take into consideration what are the worst case scenarios uh, that are possible. Then you need to get into another question, which is what to do, what to do to derail the outcome. This is trying to play the devil's advocate. Now let's say, as a team or as a company, there are people who, who are pro-change and there are, there are a, set, a segment of people who are not wanting to change because there's fear, anxiety, 
and there are a lot of thoughts in terms and resistance could come in you need to iron out that let's say you want to create a world class product or a world class portal but if your users are not interested in using the product because of certain anxieties or due to some uh, challenges that they have then your product is going to fail because the users are not going to adopt so as a problem solver you also need to take into context in terms of what are the worst case scenarios or uh, cases where something can derail the outcomes right so we looked at what can actually derail our outcomes you know we came up with things like low collaboration of stakeholders having no budget allocated lack of user empathy that is not understanding what the user actually wants then spending less time in understanding uh, the mass uh, you know customers sorry maintain status quo prevent uh, you know the big changes maintain power parity you will see this there be lot of politics uh, in the companies there be lot of uh, you know anxiety it could be a lot of insecurities existing so all these must be highlighted here in terms of what can derail the outcome right then comes why preserve sabotaging if i was a party who's really not interested in changing if i was a part of a group which really didn't believe that we don't need any solutions then uh, we are also that way capturing those stakeholders who have these problem right why are we trying to preserve sabotaging that is why do we want the problem to still persist it's a very powerful question uh, for any problem solver to understand in terms of why would some parties not want to change why would they still want the problem to continue right for example you are trying to replace a legacy system with a new state of the art system you also need to understand why you need to change why the people are resistant to change right i have worked in a lot of change management projects where a 100 plus team was going to be replaced by a solution uh, where 70% of the team would get fired so do you think it is a good scenario for the users to cooperate obviously those users would try to sabotage the problem right would try to preserve the problem will still want the problem to exist so you need to understand this user context as well in terms of why does a certain group want to preserve the sabotage right lack of future clarity lack of visibility into the future job losses lack of budget lack of what not so you need to understand this beautiful concept in terms of why would some parties want to derail the outcomes why would they want to con- control this problem being solved from this gives a lot of clarity which which we actually miss out as problem solvers otherwise lot of uh, techniques already exist in the uh, you know product management world in the design thinking uh, world in terms of how do you prioritize problems how do you pick up problem and then flow with it even before getting to how might we statement or jobs to be done before defining jobs to be done or before defining how might we or concretizing the problem statement these are certain aspects softer aspects that needs to be considered if you want to have a successful problem framing until unless you don't consider all these concepts all these uh, uh, points it becomes i think it's uh, the problem that we are trying to solve will be very shallow so uh, friends this is basically what i wanted to bring into context you can use uh, business uh, model canvas you can use uh, stakeholder swot analysis you could use ogsm for your business needs you could use product vision these are some of the templates which uh, can be used but all in all i think it it requires putting pen to paper and pouring out all your thoughts in terms of looking at uh, all these biases that can exist once you approach uh, and understand these biases problem framing becomes a lot more easier the how might we actually which we framed um usually it takes about 5 days it takes 5 days of exploring the problem before we finally fix and understand what what is the problem we want to solve so trust me friends when you do this exercise there's a lot more clarity that will sink in right so this is what we did in terms of understanding no clear view of the order to fulfillment journey then we went through this exercise of understanding uh, contextualizing the problem in terms of biases and the last part was we tried to get very specific in terms of hey what is the worst case scenario look like and 
why would anybody not want the problem to be solved? So these these are some of the points that we need to ponder uh, upon, which will kind of give you 360 degree view of the problem. So this kind of gave me a lot of new dimensions. It gave me a lot of insights in terms of how to think about a problem. And it was really, really insightful and mind, mind blowing for me. So I think the remaining piece I will not cover because I think uh, that was not the scope. Uh, you do empathy map, user research, you understand the problem statement, basically frame the problem in terms of who has the problem, what is the problem all about, where and why. Then you can also look at in terms of you know, trying to specify it using a template. Um, the reference in, uh, information which I want to share is that you can look at Design Sprint Academy. They're one of the pioneers for uh, problem solving or problem framing approaches. Uh, Design Sprint Academy, uh, inspiration from Google. So they do a wonderful work in terms of uh, defining problem framing, uh, problems using the problem framing technique. So medium.com has a lot of product management content. Most of you will be aware of it. There's a lot of problem framing content that's available on medium.com, which is really, really mature content. Uh, so I regularly use romanpickler.com, which is uh, for the templates, uh, any of the templates which you want to use for these techniques, uh, you can approach and look at this particular site. Some of the product management uh, tips I would like to share with you folks is, uh, at least in my company, I've seen that data is a big challenge, right? So if you are able to understand your data ecosystem, understand where the data is flowing from, how do you capture the data? How do you make sense of the data? Uh, what is the relationship uh, that the stakeholders have with the data? Uh, the term I would like to leave you with is data ecosystem mapping. If you're able to get a sense of what data exists with you in your world, it becomes a lot more easier in terms of what new kind of data you want to generate. Okay, so do not take shortcuts. This is a classic product management yarn in terms of interview as many users as possible. It should be as minimum as six to eight users at least. You had to practice empathy. Uh, I attended a lot of mindful class, mindfulness classes. So if you meditate, there are a lot you can you know practice empathy better. So as product managers, it's a good practice to you know get into meditation, do five to ten minutes of meditation on a daily basis. Those are the times when you actually there are aha moments and you get really awesome ideas, right? Uh, also, the last point is take the team along. The team has to get a buy-in. You can't do it alone. So this is classic product management gyan, but I thought uh, some of them would, would be probably new to you. So with this, I would like to end my webinar topic for today. Thank you for patiently listening. Uh, Linda, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, it was very insightful. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. OK, so we can uh, turn now to the question answer uh, session. Uh, Maybe you can just leave on your presentation if you need to return to reference some of the questions. You can still leave it on for now, the presentation, and then I'll uh, take the screen back. Okay. Um, the first question it comes from Ashish Gupta. Um, he's asking, do you identify the right potential customer before or after defining the problem? Uh, could you repeat that, please? Uh, he's asking, do you identify the right potential customer before or after defining the problem? I think this has to happen before, right? So you need yeah. to understand the customers before, you understand mm -hmm. uh, potential stakeholders before. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of background work you need to do in terms of reading up a lot in terms of who the customer is, which industry they come from, who are their competitors, what problems are they facing? You should. You may want to look at their balance sheets. You may want to look at uh, some of the literature that's available online. You know, so the some amount of background work will help you understand if you're trying to work with the right stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I think uh, research is necessary. Okay, thank you. Sankar Ganesh is asking: While building the product, should we solve problems that engineers love to build? Or build something which customers love to use, or it should should it be, um, or should it solve inevitable problems for the customers' customers? Such questions. Yeah, so it's a good question. The answer to this is 
always put the customer at the center. You're solving problems for the customer, not for yourself. Customer is the hero, you are not the hero. So until unless you make the customer win, you don't win. So it has to always have customer context. It's nothing to do with the engineering context. Engineering context in terms of what kind of solutions you can pick up, et cetera, is an afterthought, is afterthought. So whenever I coach PMs, I tell them one thing, don't even think about the solution while you're trying to get into a discovery phase. It's still in the problem discovery phase. So stick with the problem mindset. Even stop thinking about the problem. Stop thinking about how you're going to code it, how you're going to develop it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Vaibhav Kandelwal is asking, if a PM is new to the company, how can he or she find out what have the company tried in the past? Uh, referencing the contextualization, the problem slide. If you're new to the company, you got to read a lot. Uh, trust me, every company has a lot of content which was already churned out and it's available in some SharePoint, some folders, some locations. And what happens is when you start reading up, uh, you will start trying to make connects in terms of, hey, I've read this piece of information. Who can I actually reach out to? And then when you actually reach out to that person who would have worked on this uh, content, they will give you a lot of uh, new perspective and they would in turn connect you to or direct you to newer content. So I think the first six months will go in reading a lot of information, consuming a lot of information. So that's what a PM must do in terms of understanding. They must also start doing a lot of research by themselves, not only uh, they should do indirect research or secondary research in terms of reading up on the internet, reading up all the content that's available on the SharePoints or wherever the knowledge repository exists in the company. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nikhil is asking, um, how would you approach gathering the ASIS process from customer? Would you gather all okay. requirements uh, right at the beginning or would you follow an iterative approach and seek clarification as needed? So I would say it's a good question. So uh, as is, I would say the best uh, possible way to do it is try to visually represent information. You will have only few touch points with the customer. You cannot continuously interrogate the customer for multiple days, right? Hence, even if you get that 30 minutes or 40 minutes from an important stakeholder, try to consume that information and immediately visually represent it in the form of a flow chart or a process map, or even in some sort of a storyboarding that you can do, try to represent it visually. And there's an instant connect with the stakeholders and you immediately kind of can concrete whatever information is pushed onto you. Instead, if you try to type information or record information, there's a lot of thing which is missed out. This will also cause a lot of back and forth with the customers. You spend a lot of time, you waste a lot of time in trying to finally arrive at what, what was actually conveyed by the customer. So stick to visual representation, try to use uh, process maps, try to use some sort of visual representation, use your board, use a paper, show it to your customers, get a kind of okay on it. That's mm -hmm. okay. And Nikhil D. Mehta is also asking, how do you address the business understanding of the problem, especially when you do not have the domain understanding? Would you rely yeah. on the data? at hand or look for a domain expert to give insights? So I, so that is something that comes with experience, right? There's no perfect answer to how do you do it, but it uh, requires a lot of reading up from your side, right? There's a lot of research because multiple stakeholders give you a lot of information. So you should be able to make sense and connect the dots. So when you reach out to the business users, you don't know if they understand the complete context. So you, as a problem solver need to consume that information, then also talk to other stakeholders to make sense of if they're solving the right problems. So if you use this problem technique that I was talking to you about, it will bring in a lot more clarity in terms of different stakeholders throwing information at you and then you trying to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Abhinav Sharma is asking, how price management is concerned with the product management? What is the connection between both, if any? So pricing management is very important, especially ultimately everything is about money, right? You got to show people the money, they show people the value that comes out of it. Not necessarily all the time money, but uh, 
especially when there's a pitching exercise you figured out a problem and then you're actually trying to say hey i'm going to build this awesome product or i'm going to build this awesome feature or this enhancement into the existing product and then you need to pitch so how do you define roi until unless you don't communicate through numbers uh, it could be financials it could be numbers in terms of what is the revenue increase customer adoption rate increase or reduction in cycle time so you got to call out in terms of what pains you are solving or what gains are you trying to improve it has to come out in the form of numbers so whenever there's a pitching exercise and you're asking for money in order to create the solution it becomes very very necessary financial management is very necessary getting into epida terms like epida trying to understand roi all this is very very relevant especially during the pitching exercise when you're asking for money from people to create a solution Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, for example, if you were to hire an assistant for yourself in product management now, what would be the things that you would be looking for in a candidate? Uh, they must have a very clear uh, mindset. They should have uh, in terms of uh, problem solving, right? The approaches. So when we uh, interview can a senior level candidates, what we are looking for is not. experience but we are trying to see how they flow with the problem uh, how they approach the problem uh, what is their thought process all about so it's a really intense exercise uh, we kind of put them through a ca uh, case scenario use cases scenario to actually see how much the uh, person knows demonstrable assets is the term where resumes are dead now resumes are dead you can't just give a resume to somebody and say hey i'm awesome you got to demonstrate in terms of what work you've done in the past do you have artifacts do you have use cases do you have referrals and then finally you you put all this to test by in the form of a real uh, real time exercise that's given to you which is pretty in intense and what we look at is how do you approach the problem right and that comes with experience okay thank you and when i'm calling up people say our audience usually when i'm calling them on the phone and asking questions about what would you like to hear in webinars and so on and often people say you know with all these you know pandemic and all the stuff going on in the world they're thinking like what are the main trends um, that are going on you know what do you see happening in product management or maybe what are the great points why people should go into product management because many people want transfer into this field now uh right now that you see covid that's happening right so there's a lot of uh, work from home there's a lot more remote stuff that is being done so even in organizations right across the world now they're trying to see how can we uh, make things more remote can we deliver trainings remotely can we have those connects remotely how do we enable developers to work remotely how do we ensure the same amount of efficiency exists remotely so looking at uh, problems like these where uh, earlier collaborations used to happen offline how do you enable that online how do you make uh, make the world still work the way it was working earlier uh, remotely right so these are certain awesome challenges that exist also aspects in terms of how do you keep the costs low how do you produce something locally how do you so these are i mean it it is opened up the world is it's opened up to a great new kind of problems that anybody can solve especially on the remote basis right if somebody is working remotely how can we still make things happen the way it used to happen mm -hmm. thank you so much um uh, thank you so, so much for your answers i'm going to um, uh, turn the screen over to myself now uh, so if you could just switch off your screen and uh, i'm going to return um my presentation okay can you see my screen now yep yeah thank you so just to wrap up our webinar so we've got a couple of things left to wrap up uh, so we we're going to give you some additional information uh, we're going to also give you the gift so who should be the speakers during our course uh, as i said before those are lots of people from industry from the product management industry from tech industry so who are going to be the speakers on our course so there are people from microsoft you know booking uh, google shell and so on so we've got very 
experienced people with lots of know-how in, in, in the industry. Um, so let's take a little deeper look at the program. So what can you expect to get in our uh, product management online course? So first of all, we start off with the basic product manager skills. Um, and then section two, moving into skills for mid-level product managers. Then we do also cover the mobile products. Um, then the next section is product manager level up. And again, as I said, we do the thesis, the graduation project, and we also assist you, you know, with your employment and we do the um, training for the interviews and so on. So lots of useful things we provide you with. So what results can you expect from completing the course? Um, you can expect a comprehensive knowledge base, which is necessary for your professional development as well as lectures from the industry's leading professionals. We'll give you lots of useful product management skills. There are practical tasks in the form of homeworks ex and exercises. So, and you'll get your own mentor and you can, you know, who'll be giving you your feedback on how well you did in your homework. Are you on point or, or you're off track? So we'll train you for that as well. And there are also lots of high quality contacts uh, and networking opportunities for industry professionals. And there you can see an example, a sample of digital certificates, which you'll receive at the end by graduating from this course. Um, so you can find out more details about the course by following the link at productstar.org, product alive. So as I said before, guys, it'd be so useful if you could leave your name, your country, your phone number, an email, and we can get in touch with you, you know, and then you'll never miss any latest updates, our newest webinars, and lots of other good information. And don't be scared if you get, we get a phone call from an unknown number. So it's just me or my colleagues, you know, my team members who are calling you up just to see, you know, get feedback from you guys, how you found the webinar, did you find it useful? What do you want to hear about and so on and see what else we can assist you with, what information. So now is the time, you know, as I said before, the best question will receive a cool gift at the end of the session. So the cool gift is a book on product management. It's called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. So Prashant, uh, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking going through the questions, you really like the, the question by Nikhil D. Mehta. So I think we're gonna give the book to Nikhil. Yes, so Nikhil, please get in touch with um, our member, our team member, Yulia Kenya, and she'll give you all the details on how you can redeem your gift. So congratulations, Sam. Uh, just to wrap up, um, there is another good section on our site where you can do your homework, where you can rate your product manager skills. There's a chart. I need to fill in your name, your surname, and answer basically various questions, and you need to answer them um, honestly, basically, where you can rate yourself from zero to five. Zero being just, you know, meaning that you're just starting out in the product management, and five is that you're already a top-level manager in product management. So that'd be a very useful thing for you guys. So yes, uh, it seems like we're wrapping out today. Yeah, please follow our Telegram channel at productstar.org. Please come back to our YouTube channel, watch the webinar. And yeah, we'll be in touch with you guys or email or WhatsApp group or by calling you. And yes, I would really like to thank Prashant again for giving such a great presentation, an interesting subject this time, something unusual, a problem framing. I hope you found, found it really useful guys. And thank you, Prashant. So last word to you. Thanks, Linda. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. everybody. Very nice. Yes. Um, okay, everybody, have a nice evening wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Stay safe and yeah, thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.